Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first day of the Virginia Farmers Market Association second annual Virginia Farmers Market Food Safety Summit. My name is Kim Hutchinson, and I'm the executive director of the Virginia Farmers Market Association. The goal of this summit is to give farmers market managers and vendors the information they need to know about food safety requirements in Virginia. We are extremely grateful to the Virginia Department of Health, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Virginia Family Nutrition Program, and the Virginia Alcohol Beverage Control Authority for their partnership on this event. I would also like to thank the USDA, Farm Credit, Virginia State University, Prince Charitable Trust, Virginia Fresh Match, Virginia is for Farmers Market Lovers, and Farmers Market University for the support of BAFMA and Virginia Farmers Markets. They are recording, excuse me, Today, we are recording each presenter and will share those recordings as well as links to the resources they share. These videos and slides will be posted in the next two weeks and an email will go out when they are posted. We have shared all the questions you submitted with our presenters. Please use the Q&A box to ask any additional questions you may have. We will collect all the questions and answers and send those out as well as soon as we have them. We will answer as many questions today as we are able to. Um, and any questions that we need to research, we will have that, um, that we will uh, collect that information and we will forward it out with all of the um, FAQs in two weeks. If you would like proof of attendance of today's Food Safety Summit, we will be putting a link in the form in the chat at the end of this webinar. There you can request proof of participation and a certificate will be emailed to you. If you are watching the recording now, you can still get proof of participation by taking the quiz we have available through Farmers Market University. Farmers Market University is an online training platform we launched recently. It hosts multiple trainings for farmers market managers, including Market Management 101 and 201. And we'll, we will be adding vendor trainings in the coming months as well. You can find out more at farmersmarketuniversity.org. All of the recordings from today will be available there, as well as an automated quiz based on questions presented by our presenters. If you pass the quiz, the certificate will be emailed to you. Just inside about the certificates, I have loved seeing so many of you posting your certificates on your tents at the market. It reinforces to shoppers that you take food safety serious. The Virginia Farmers Market Association, or VAFMA, is a membership organization whose mission is to support farmers markets through education, networking, advocacy, and innovation and we support the growth and sustainability of farmers markets statewide. If you find our trainings and resources valuable, we encourage you to consider becoming a member or donating to BAFNA today. There's a link in the chat box for more information. Today, we're gonna to hear from the Virginia Department of Health or VDH and the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. You'll hear us refer to this agency as VDAX. The first two presentations will be an overview of farmer's market food safety requirements from VDH and VDAX. They will be followed by produce safety and weights and measures. We have linked to today's agenda in the chat box. So again, any questions that you have, please drop those in the Q&A. If you guys want to just drop a conversation as to what markets you're from, your names, etc., you can drop those in the chat box, but any questions, drop those in the Q&A. We will be monitoring that and we will be answering those questions as they come in. We also will take a break in between the different, pres uh, the different presenters to ask questions to them um, during today's presentation. So please drop those in the Q&A. So with all of that being said, let's get started. From the Virginia Department of Health, we have Whitney Wright, the Environmental Health Coordinator in the Office of Environmental Health Services, Division of Food and General Environmental Services. And after Whitney, we'll be hearing from Jessica Klemenzik. I am sorry, Jessica. The Food Safety and General Environmental Services. Um, no, we will not. We will be hearing from Jessica, the Food Safety Quality Assurance Coordinator in the Office of Environmental Health Services. Sorry, I just gave Jessica a whole new job. I apologize. Um, after the Virginia Department of Health, we will be hearing from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So more to come. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Whitney Wright. Whitney, take it away. Thank you so much, Kim. I really appreciate that warm introduction. Um, good morning and welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. 
Um, today, we will be providing an overview of the Virginia Department of Health Permitting and Food Safety 101 at Virginia Farmers Markets. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, my name is Whitney Wright, and I am the Environmental Health Coordinator in the Office of Environmental Health Services Food Safety Division. Presenting with me this morning is Jessica Clemensic, who is our Food Safety Quality Assurance Coordinator. And as Kim mentioned earlier, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A during the presentation, and we'll have time at the end to cover as many as we can. And also, as always, you can send us questions directly through the VDH Food Safety Inbox, which we'll provide at the end. Next slide, please. In the Virginia Department of Health uh, Food Safety Division, we have a way of speaking our own language, as Kim alluded to earlier. Uh, sometimes we use several acronyms when discussing food safety. So this slide provides a few of the more commonly used acronyms um, that, we'll, that you'll see in today's presentation. CFPM is Certified Food Protection Manager, FDA Food and Drug Administration, LHD, Local Health District, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, PIC, Person in Charge, TCS Food, Time, Temperature, Control for Safety Food, TFE, Temporary Food Establishment, VDAX, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and VDH, Virginia Department of Health. Next slide. We are often asked, how can you tell the difference between a VDH vendor and a farm or non-VDH vendor at a farmer's market? One way to tell is by looking or asking to see their paper permit or sticker permit. VDH vendors that are set up in tents or other temporary setups should have a paper permit posted from VDH. Mobile units such as food trucks that are permitted through VDH will have a sticker that is affixed to the unit in a location visible to consumers. So seeing is believing. You can also look at what they're serving to help determine if it's a VDH vendor. VDH vendors will be preparing food on site for sale or sample directly to consumers. And as you will see on the right side of the slide, farm vendors or non-VH vendors are either permitted or inspected by VDAX or may be exempt by law, or are farmers selling their own farm-produced products or offering samples of their farm-produced products. Next slide. There's a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, between VDH and VDAX. Under this MOU, many food vendors at farmer's markets may be exempt from permitting and inspection by VDH. Vendors who are not regulated by VDH include vendors selling food items from approved sources, such as firms inspected by VDAX that include home and commercial kitchens and food and beverage manufacturers. We also do not regulate vendors selling packaged food items that are exempt from VDAX inspection under the code section shown here. These vendors can sell their exempt products at farmer's markets and do not require a VDH permit to sample these foods. VDAX will be sharing more details on this a little later this morning. Next slide, please. Section 35.1-14 regulations governing restaurants, advisory standards for exempt entities in the Code of Virginia states, the provision of the Food and Drug Administration's food code shall not apply to farmers offering their own farm produced products directly to consumers for their personal use. Whether such sales occur on such farms market or farmer's farm or farm market, in addition to this exemption, under the MOU between VDH and VDAX mentioned earlier, sampling of these farm-produced products are not subject to VDH permit or inspection. 
Next slide. So how do you tell the difference between a sample and a food service? Examples of permissible, permissible sampling under the MOU, not regulated by VDH, are things like cutting up produce for raw consumption, cutting up baked goods for consumption, heating, cooking a farm produced sausage or other meat product with limited modification, understanding that seasoning is acceptable but not made into a dish, mixing of dips and service with chips or pretzels, providing salsa for sampling with chips or pretzels. Those are examples of permissible sampling. Examples of activities are samples that require a VDH permit are things like assembling a pizza, creating a stir fry, casserole or salad, or adding a piece of commercially prepared hot dog to their baked good. Next slide, please. At farmer's markets across Virginia, you will typically find three types of VDH permitted vendors. Permitted food establishments. This is an annually permitted food establishment that is setting up as a vendor at a farmer's market. Mobile food units. These are also annually permitted food establishments that are mobile or on wheels. And one of the more common vendors at farmer's markets are the temporary food establishments. These are temporary vendors that are only permitted in connection with a temporary event or farmer's market. Now let me get into a little more details of each. Next slide, please. VDH permitted food establishments sometimes choose to offer food from their normal brick and mortar operations and set up as a temporary vendor at an event such as a farmer's market. When they choose to do so, they are allowed to prepare and serve the same types of food using the same processes at the market that is done at their primary location and do not need to obtain additional permits. A copy of their permit still must be posted and they are subject to VDH inspection and inspections are based on a VDH risk assessment risk category assigned to that establishment. Next slide. A mobile food unit is defined as a food establishment mounted on wheels, excluding boats in the water readily movable from place to place at all times during operation and shall include push carts, trailers, trucks, or vans. The unit, all operations, and all equipment must be integral to and be within or attached to the unit. These are commonly called food trucks or carts and are permitted by the local health department where the commissary or owner operator resides if a commissary is not required. Due to the nature of the unit being mobile, these food establishments have an annual permit sticker that is valid statewide. However, in some jurisdictions in the state, they may have additional permitting or requirements. So we advise to please check ahead of setup and operation. Next slide, please. Mobile unit inspections, like brick and mortar food establishment inspections, are done based on a risk assessment to determine the frequency. I've mentioned several times today about mobile unit sticker, mobile units having a sticker. Well, on the bottom left of this slide is an example of a 2024 mobile unit permit sticker. In the middle of the sticker, you can see the month with an X and year the permit expires. Under that, you will find other information related to the mobile unit and the local health department name where the mobile unit was permitted. Again, these permit stickers should be in plain view from where the public is served. Next slide, please. Their last VDH category of permit and probably the most common you'll find at farmer's markets is temporary food establishments or TFEs. 
And there are Virginia food regulations. A TFE is defined as a food establishment that operates for a period of no more than 14 consecutive days in conjunction with a single event or celebration. TFEs are also inspected based on risk assessment and typically are inspected ahead of first service. Next slide, please. Farmers market managers and vendors should be aware that an application for a TFE permit must be submitted at least 10 days prior to the farmer's market. This is very important to ensure that TFE vendors provide the local health department time to process their application, obtain any additional information that might be needed, and to plan for any inspections that, not, that might be required of head of operation. We recommend checking with the local health department where the farmer's market is located in advance to discuss any additional requirements that might be subject to that location. Permits for TFEs are only valid for the specified period of time on the permit up to 12 months. It is not transferable from person to person. Permits must be posted during operation at the event. Next slide, please. TFEs are required to have all food preparation occur on site at the event and are required to have the person in charge, the PIC, be a certified food protection manager, CFPM. So no food from home. Next slide. Here's an example of what a VDH TFE permit looks like. The permit must be posted where it can easily be seen by the public when operating and serving food. The permit will include the expiration date, the name of the operator, the type of permit, the name of the local health department, and the risk category. Now I'm going to pass it over to Jessica to get into the operational requirements of VDH permitted food establishments and to walk you through some example scenarios. Jessica? I'm here, thank you, Whitney. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So regardless of what type of VDH permitted food vendor you are, there are operational requirements that apply. Uh, the PIC or PIC is the person present at a food establishment who is responsible for the food service operation at the time of inspection. A certified food protection manager or CFPM is an employee that has the authority to oversee and manage food preparation activities and food service. To receive a CFPM certificate, the candidate must pass a test from one of the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, recognized programs. This credential demonstrates that they know what they need to about food safety and handling. A TCS food is a food that needs to be kept at specific temperatures to stay safe to eat. This helps prevent harmful germs from growing or making toxins in the food. Most VDH permitted food establishments are required to have at least one CFPM. The exceptions are food establishments that do not serve TCS foods or do not cook TCS foods or only reheat fully cooked commercially processed foods and or only cold hold commercially processed foods. If you are going to cook or cool any TCS foods, your operation will need a CFPM. Next, all food needs to come from approved sources. An approved source is a facility where the food is produced, prepared, or processed and meets or exceeds the standards of the responsible regulatory agency. This commonly means that the facility has a valid permit and is inspected on a regular basis by a regulatory agency. If you aren't sure your soup food suppliers are an approved source, please reach out to your local health department and I'll explain how to do that later in this presentation. Next, 
Think of employee health and hygiene as a three-legged stool. Each leg represents a different part of practices we are going to be looking primarily at. And this is employee health, hand washing, and no bare hand contact. Uh, if one leg isn't strong, the others won't work well either. These go hand in hand to prevent foodborne illnesses. Next, the Virginia food regulations, which are modeled after the FDA food code, identify the proper time and temperatures for which various TCS foods need to be cooked to kill disease-causing germs. Your CFPM should know what these minimum temperatures are and should be monitoring and verifying the temperatures with a food thermometer. Make sure cold food stays cold and hot food stays hot. This stops harmful germs from growing too much and making someone ill. And the magic numbers are 41 degrees or below for cold food and 135 degrees or above for hot food. Lastly, when utensils or equipment get dirty, they can transfer disease causing germs to the food, which might make someone sick. If utensils or equipment aren't cleaned and sanitized often, Bits of old food are left on the utensils and equipment at room temperature, allowing the bacteria in that old food to grow fast. If ready to eat food touches those dirty utensils or equipment, the food can get contaminated too. Next slide, please. So again, uh, we have examples of our TFE hand washing stations here. And they come in various shapes and sizes and forms as you can see in the slide. Um, regardless of what type of hand wash station you are using, they all have to have a gravity fed container with a spigot filled with warm water from an approved source, a catch bucket to keep the dirty water from falling on the ground, hand soap, and paper towels. Next slide, please. So this slide provides a visual of the overview of five risk factors for foodborne illness, which I kind of covered in the operational requirements. Um, but to review, the five risk factors for food foodborne illness are food from unapproved sources. So make sure you have your receipts and invoices available and it includes water. You need to use an approved water hose. Green garden hoses are not acceptable. They need to be food grade. The second foodborne illness risk factor is improper employee health and hygiene. Please do not work when you are sick. You need to also wash your hands after changing tasks and change gloves when they become dirty or torn and then wash your hands and put new gloves on. Next, we have improper holding temperatures, and this includes hot and cold holding. You need to use a thin tip probe thermometer to check your food temperatures and keep thermometers in your cooler or refrigerator at the warmest location to easily monitor the temperature. Next is improper cooking temperatures. Again, you want to use a thin tip probe thermometer such as the one in the slide <clears throat> to check your temperatures. Lastly, dirty and or contaminated utensils and equipment are also a contributing risk factor to foodborne illness. So you want to make sure that you wash, rinse, and sanitize your food contact surfaces by setting up the three tub setup that you see in the right corner of the slide. Check your sanitizer concentration using the appropriate test strip, whether it's chlorine or quaternary ammonia. Prevent cross-contamination of ready-to-eat foods and prevent contamination of clean utensils and equipment. Next slide, please. You need to make sure that you dispose of your wastewater properly. Please do not dispose it on the ground or in a storm drain. Check with your market manager or coordinator to see if they are providing wastewater disposal. And approved methods of disposal include uh, through a sanitary sewer connection 
or approved wastewater tanks collected by an approved wastewater disposal company. Next slide, please. So instead of going through all of the steps for uh, obtaining a TFE permit, uh, we are going to use scenarios or examples. Um, we have a couple of scenarios here for you. So scenario number one is Whitney wants to sell tacos at his local farmer's market. What does he need to do? The first thing he should do is contact the local health department. They will provide him with the temporary food application and walk him through the process. It's important to contact the local health department because not all local health departments use the state application. And there may also be local code requirements specific for events like farmer's markets. Whitney will need to complete the TFE application and pay the $40 state fee. Keep in mind, local fees may apply. And this needs to be done at least 10 days prior to participating in a farmer's market. The $40 fee covers you for the calendar year. You may be required to complete new applications, but you do not have to pay the fee to participate in multiple farmer's markets. You do not have to pay the $40 every time you want to participate in multiple farmer's markets. It's a one-time fee during the calendar year. Uh, you need to make sure that you keep your receipt so that you don't have to pay that fee again if you're within the calendar year and you're going to another, uh, traveling to another locality. So some tips for Whitney to know when filling out his applications. Know the name and location of the farmer's market. Know who the market coordinator is and have their contact information available. Know the dates of the farmer's market. This is the date range which you plan to operate. The dates of operation could be a single, farm, single farmer's market or could be multiple farmer's markets or a market with multiple dates like the Buckrow Farmer's Market, which is a weekly market occurring throughout the spring and summer here in Hampton. Um, you also wanna make sure you know what foods will be on the menu. Any food for sale must be on the menu uh, because we are going, the, the environmental health specialists or inspectors are going to review your application and um, make sure you understand what processes you're using to uh, prepare your food. Keep in mind that you can't add items to the menu the day of the farmer's market and unapproved food cannot be sold. Next slide, please. The second scenario we have is Whitney obtained a TFE permit for selling tacos last month from Richmond City Health Department. And he has decided he would like to participate in a farmer's market in Virginia Beach. What does he need to do? If the permit has not expired, he needs to contact the Virginia Beach Health Department and provide them with a copy of his TFE permit issued by Richmond City Health Department his most recent VDH inspection report, and let them know he is planning to participate in a farmer's market in Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach Health Department will determine if any additional steps are needed. If the permit is expired, he needs to contact Virginia Beach Health Department. They will provide him with the TFE application and walk him through the process again. He should also provide a copy of his receipt from Richmond City to avoid any additional state fees if he's within the calendar year. Next slide, please. We have collected a lot of frequently asked questions that we receive. So I'm gonna present them to you. Um, the first one is, do I need a permit to sample food? If you fall under VDH, you need to have a permit to sample any type of food. Food samples must be prepared in the permitted food establishment or on site. If you are a farm producer and providing a sample of your farm produced item, you do not need a VDH TFE permit. Can farm vendors offer samples of their farm produced fruit and or vegetables? 
Yes, if you are a farmer or grower, you can offer samples of your product and do not require a VDH TFE permit. Can vendors offer samples of farm-raised cooked meat, such as sausages? It depends. If you produce the meat from animals on your farm, you do not require a VDH TFE permit. If you produce the meat from animals on your farm and want to sell it as a sandwich or a meal, then a VDH TFE permit is required. Next slide, please. Can a vendor selling oysters at a farmer's market provide a shucked or cooked sample to a customer? Yes, but the vendor has to be a certified dealer, which means they have a certificate of inspection from VDH Division of Shellfish and is listed on the Interstate Certified Shellfish shellfish shippers list. That's a mouthful. Can I prepare food at home to bring to the farmer's market if I'm a VDH permitted vendor? That is a big red no. Food must come from approved sources and suppliers and be prepared in a VDH permitted establishment. There are some exceptions if you fall under VDAX inspection and permit. Do I need a ham? Oh, excuse me. Do I need a permit to prepare beverages such as coffee, Thai tea, or lemonade? Yes, ice and beverages are considered food. Ice and water must come from an approved source and beverages must be prepared on site. Lastly, do I need a hand wash station if I am wearing gloves? Yes, you need to provide a hand wash station at your booth. Next slide, please. To our market managers and coordinators, we want you to know that we are here to help you have a, su a successful market. Here are some points to consider. Some localities have local ordinances with more stringent requirements than the state food regulations. Some localities have local event coordinator forms to complete. And as always, do not hesitate to contact us with your questions. How can you help us? Work with your local health department when organizing your market. Let us know when and where the market will open in advance. Keep in mind, VDH TFE vendors need to apply for a permit at least 10 days prior to their participation in the farmer's market. Provide your list of vendors so we can determine who is exempt, who needs permitting, who requires a CFPM, who falls under VDAX. Request the vendor or farmer to provide you with a copy of their VDH or VDAX permit and keep that on hand. Next slide, please. Now, how can we help you? Again, do not hesitate to contact us for any questions that you may have. And refer to our resources slide at the end of this presentation. The slide that you see is our local health district's page. You can find your local health department one of two ways. Use the health department locator tool, which is circled in orange, or refer to the map and click on the local health district name. Once you enter the local health district page, click on the environmental health or food safety link. Next slide, please. This slide indicates what localities have local requirements for TFE and mobile units. So again, always contact your local health department. Next slide, please. When you visit our Food Safety in Virginia website, this is what our main landing page looks like. And as you can see, there's plenty of information for you to look through. Next slide, please. We've put together a list of resources for food vendors. Again, our main food safety landing page will show you how to apply for a food permit, including mobile units and temporary food establishments, certified food protection manager information, list of localities that have local ordinances, employee health, food regulations, and food allergen awareness. You can also look up the VDH and VDAX Memorandum of Understanding and find your local health district. 
And you can contact us at foodsafety at vdh.virginia.gov. And I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Next slide, please. We wanted to cite the Code of Virginia exemptions for VDACs and VDH. So if you would like to read those exemptions, you can go follow the links. Next slide, please. Whitney and I want to thank you uh, for attending this morning, and you can feel free to reach out to us directly um, or through the food safety inbox. Next slide, please. Any questions for us? Thank you so much. We have, uh, before we move on to VDAX, we have a couple of questions that relate to VDH that have been dropped in the chat box, and I was scrolling through trying to get them. Cottage law question, we'll answer that through VDAX. Um, I have a question um, regarding permitted facilities. Are you able to cook in a restaurant and then bring your food to an event? Um, or does all food need to be prepared and cooked on site? So if you are a VDH permitted restaurant and you want to participate in the farmer's market, you can cook your items on in your VDH permitted restaurant and bring it to the event without applying for a VDH TFE permit. Okay. And, and I'll add, uh, it's always wise to check with the local health department that issued your permit because there are some um, local restrictions sometimes or lo local ordinances involved. And so whenever a uh, permitted restaurant wants to do that, the best bet is to check with the local health department ahead of setup to make sure that they don't need anything extra. Okay. Um, and again, let me reiterate, if everybody would please drop your questions into the Q&A versus the chat, I would really appreciate it because we have folks monitoring that and answering it. It's hard to, they get lost in the chat, um, but I'm doing my best. Uh, Here's another question for VDH. Lemonade being prepared in a VDH inspected kitchen and then being sold at the market. Is that okay? I guess they're asking, does that need to have a TFE? So if the vendor, the lemonade vendor has a VDH permitted facility in which they're preparing the lemonade, yes, they can bring that to the farmer's market without having to apply for additional permit. Okay. Um, I have a question about frozen soup. Um, do I need a temporary permit if I am selling VDAX approved frozen soup, but then I am heating it up at the market and providing ready to eat samples of the same soup? I do not believe that would require a VDH permit, but um, maybe somebody with VDAX might be able to answer that better. Okay, we will throw that over into the VDAX pile, um, their parking lot. So, and then I had one on here when you were talking about wastewater and if I'm, and I can't find the exact question, but they wanted to know if you have unused ice, are you allowed to put that, are you allowed to dump that into the grass or no? If I didn't capture that correctly, please let me I think you got yeah. it right, Kim. It just says, um, does the slide mean you can't put unused ice in grass? Thank you. Uh, so I, I would not recommend that. I would check with your um, market coordinator to see if there is a um, proper area to dispose of the unused ice. Okay. And we have a variety of questions in the chat, which we will um, ask you guys to look at and see if you can answer regarding um, a variety of things that fall under you. So um, let me see. Uh, all right. So we have a couple regarding mushrooms. Um, if they're selling gourmet mushrooms, they're doing a cooking demo um, as people normally have no idea how to cook mushrooms. We are looking at very basic cooking, salt, pepper, butter, or bite-sized crab cakes. Will we need a permit and inspection of our farm? 
And so it's no crab in the crab cake, it's just lion's mane mushrooms. So in the MOU <laughs> that we have with VDAX, it provided some examples of, of stuff that is acceptable for sampling, such as um, crackers or chips with a dip. Um, in terms of mushrooms, if you get beyond adding salt and pepper, um, I feel like that's probably going to trigger uh, the need for a permit from VDH. Okay. And one last question, and then we're going to move on to VDAX. And I will encourage everybody to please continue to drop all of your questions into the Q&A. Um, the question is, uh, one minute, I apologize. How does permitting change if I'm a catering licensed vendor? Uh, is the uh, catering licensed vendor one permitted by VDH? Just need some clarification on that question. Um, if you'll drop the question into the Q&A, we will get you your answer regarding catering. That's all the information I have. We'll circle back to that and get more information um, from Um, any last questions for VDH, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A. I see several of y'all are doing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, Whitney and Jessica, that was wonderful. I cannot begin to thank you. Uh, all of the information that was presented today, for those of you that may have missed something or want their contact information, we've dropped their contact information in the chat. We also will be providing all of this information in a follow-up email along with all of their contact information. So do not fret if you weren't able to capture it when they were posting their slides. All of this is gonna be sent out to you afterwards. Um, but in the meantime, please drop any questions into the chat and we will make sure that they, I mean, not into the chat, this is why you're dropping them in the chat because I keep saying the word chat. Drop them into Q&A and we will make sure that they get answered, okay? Um, sorry about the confusion, we have a new platform. Uh, we are going to be able to give everybody a copy of the transcript from the Q&A. We actually have asked all of you to provide us with questions prior to this, which we've gotten all the answers for. We are going to um, also collate that with all of the questions that are being asked today. It'll be broken down by the different um, departments, et cetera. So it'll be easy to find the information. And when I use the word easy, I am using that in quotes, but uh, we will make it as user-friendly as possible. So please do not fret. I promise you, we are capturing all of the information and we will send it all out with answers to you. Um, in the meantime, thank you both so much. That was wonderful. Are y'all going to be sticking with us or will you be hopping off? You'll be sticking with us, perfect. So, they will have an opportunity to answer some of the questions that you've dropped in the chat. And for those of you that were asking about Cottage Law, it's coming up now. I see all the folks from VDAX are hopping on. Um, next, we have the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And we're going to hear from Cam Miles, the Office of Dairy and Foods Program Manager, Rochelle Bland, Food Safety Manager, and Karen Bergen, Food Safety Manager, the Office of Dairy and Foods and VDAX Food Safety. Um, I'm sure you recognize all of their faces and have communicated with them. Uh, we thank you so much for being with us today. Again, for all of you that are going to have so many questions, and I know you're going to, please drop them in the Q&A, and we will be answering those as we go along, as well as before we jump into um, produce safety, we will give the panelists an opportunity to answer questions. So thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Pam. Take it away. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Kim. My, as Kim mentioned, my name is Pam Miles. I'm the program manager for the Office of Dairy and Foods. That also includes produce safety. And this morning before Karen and Rochelle get started on food safety at farmers markets, I'm going to give you a very short legislative update for this past 2024 General Assembly. Can you go to the first slide, please? 
thank you. <laughs> so um, during the past General Assembly, there were three bills introduced to amend the Virginia Food and Drink Law. One passed and two did not pass. So the first one that's on this slide that is going to affect all of you, um, House Bill 759 amends the Food and Drink Law, which is 3.25130 that BDH mentioned, by changing the $3,000 gross sales annual cap to a cap of $9,000 imposed on the sale of pickles and other acidified vegetables that have an equilibrium pH value of 4.6 or lower and are processed and prepared in a private home without the inspection and permit that are otherwise required to operate a food establishment. These food, these food products have to be sold in person in the Commonwealth to an individual for his own consumption and not from, for resale. And another uh, section that was added to the bill, it also amends the food and drink law in 3.25130 for all of the exemptions that they will shall not prohibit a resident in accordance with the law from advertising any of the exempt food products from, uh, from advertising them on the internet. You're not able to sell them on the internet, take uh, actually orders, but you will be able, you are able to advertise on the internet. And this is gonna clarify it in, the, in this uh, new language. It also clarifies that uninspected food products that are required to have a label placed on the principal display panel, displaying the name, physical address, and telephone number of the person preparing the food product the date the food product was per, 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 excuse me was processed and the statement not for resale processed and prepared without state inspection if the if the labels and packaging is is small enough you can have a sign at your booth with the same language so if the packaging is not large enough to bear the label with a, with what is required you can have a sign there the, the big change is this bill also amends the food and drink law by expanding the locations where uninspected low risk food products can be sold in person in the Commonwealth to include at a temporary event that operates for a period of no more than 14 consecutive days. So as we've told you in the past, you could only sell your uninspected low risk foods at a farmer's market or at your home. This new update that takes effect July 1st will allow you to also sell your uninspected foods at a temporary event that operates, as I said, for a period of no more than 14 consecutive days. And um, Rochelle and Karen will go more in depth about the exemptions in their presentation. But as I mentioned, this is one bill that passed and these changes will take place. Uh, just to summarize again, the $3,000 annual sales cap on acidified vegetables and pickles is being raised to 9,000, has to be sold in person in the Commonwealth to the individual for his own consumption, and it expands the locations. Just to summarize again, where unexpected low risk food products can be sold, it's adding that you can sell them at temporary events that operate for a period of no more than 14 consecutive days. I also wanna go over uh, two other bills that did not pass, just to give you an update on those. So there was ha House Bill 1382. This bill proposed to amend the Virginia Food and Drink Law, which is 3.25100, to provide that a food product is misbranding if it purports to be or is represented as a meat product by definition while containing no meat, unless a product's label and type of uniform size and prominence bears the word imitation followed immediately by the name of the meat food product being imitated. And we actually had a definition for a meat food, pro meat food product that says any product capable of use as human food that's made wholly or in part from any meat or other portion of the carcass of any cattle, sh sheep, swine, or goats. So what they were getting at is if a, uh, you had a vegetarian product, meat product, or cell cultured meats, uh, this bill was wanting on the label to say imitation in front of the meat product. Uh, but this bill did not pass this session. And the last bill introduced, which did not pass, is House Bill 681. This bill proposed to allow for the sale of food products made from any fruit, grain, herbs, honey, meat, milk, mushrooms, nuts, poultry, seafood, or vegetables. So just about any product by a farm employing 10 or fewer pe people or at a private home, so long as the sale was made directly to consumer and it was labeled and it has certain things laid out. But it wasn't restricting where that product could be sold directly to the end user. And this bill did not pass. So, and, and if you have any questions uh, at the end of Rochelle and Karen's uh, presentation, we can, uh, about House Bill 75, 759 that passed, um, we will uh, answer those questions for you. So this is a big change. And I'm gonna turn it over to Karen and Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rochelle Bland, and I'll be going over um, starting with jurisdiction and regulations. 
So as VDH mentioned in their presentation, there is a little, there is a difference between what VDAX regulates and what VDH regulates. And in the Commonwealth of Virginia, all food products must be made in an inspected and permitted facility unless an exemption applies and is followed. So at VDAX, we inspect retail stores such as grocery and convenience stores, large and small manufacturers, home kitchen food processing operations and warehouses, and VDH um, has jurisdiction over restaurants, temporary food establishments, and mobile units. Applicable regulations on the VDAX side include the Virginia Food and Drink Law, this is the law that goes over the exemptions that we will go over in more detail in a few slides, as well as the Code of Federal Regulations, which we adopt at the state level for manufactured foods. 21 CFR 101 goes over food labeling. 21 CFR 117 is the current good manufacturing practices that apply to you as a manufacturer. And depending on the type of food that you make, such as seafood, juice, acidified foods, and dietary supplements, there may be additional manufactured food regulations that apply. Next slide, please. We have several resources for new food businesses. We have our website, the vdax.virginia.gov, food and dairy, food, um, the Office of Dairy and Foods website. We have our food safety at vdax.virginia.gov email, as well as our phone number. The, we have several applications, but the two that are most applicable to our audience today are the home kitchen food processing operation and commercial kitchen food processing operation permit applications. On this slide, we have linked a how-to application guidance document. This takes you step-by-step -step through the application, and it is a very thorough document. So as you're going through the application uh, process, please refer to the how-to document and reach out to us if you have any questions before you submit and we'll also work with you throughout the application process if there's anything else that's needed. Next slide, please. This is just an example of our farmer's market webpage so that you guys can know what you're looking for. As you see on the um, right side, the main part of the page, it's labeled farmer's market vendors. We have our permit applications right at the top for you, as well as links to our laws and regulations and additional resources. Next slide, please. Hey. The application process, and a lot of you guys have questions about this one, so we'll get into it. The first step is once you have your completed application, you'll send it to us at foodsafety at vdax.virginia.gov. There, there is a lot of information that's required, so please take your time going through the application, the how-to document, as well as the checklist that is included with every application. You'll want to include your business information, your contact information, zoning approval if um, you are operating from your home. If you're operating from a commercial kitchen, you'll need a copy of the approval or lease agreement from the commercial kitchen you're leasing space from. You'll also need to include a food processing and storage area diagram, product list and plan distribution, ingredient list, ingredient source and recipes, and of course your labels. Because the application process can be um, very detailed and thorough, we do recommend that you apply Initially apply with um, about five, ideally five products or up to 10. Um, and then when you add new products, which we will also discuss, that process will be much quicker and we'll, all, we'll be able to update your file as you go along. Once your application process and your labels have been approved by your reviewer, um, the food safety specialist for your territory, for your region will contact you to set up a pre-operational inspection. Once you guys set up this appointment, they'll come out to your, loca to your location, go over um, your operation, your products, your labels, anything that you need to make sure you're ready to go and up and running. And after the successful completion of that inspection, they will issue you a copy of your inspection report and your permit to operate. And again, once you're approved, you're approved for the products that are in your initial application. As you add new products, you'll need to get those approved before you're able to sell them. Next slide, please. And as you as your business grows, we know that you guys are going to change your products, add new products, and that's what we like to see. And we also want to help you along that process. Um, once you have those products ready, you'll just send them to us. It's a very similar um, process to the initial application. But again, once you're already set up in the system, with us, you are um, able to get new products approved much more quickly most of the time. 
and you'll email your product list, plan distribution, ingredient list, ingredient source, recipes and labels to food safety. We will work with you back and forth until everything is ready and you will be notified when the products have been approved and added to your file and you'll be good to go from there. We also know that labels are a big expense for a business and we do highly recommend that you send us your labels for review before you have them printed. That'll avoid you guys having a typo or something missing on your label that will involve extra expenses on your part. We really do wanna help you guys get it right before you spend, you spend that money. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're getting into the exemption also known as the cottage law. Our um, home kitchen exemption from state inspection is in section 3.2-5130 of the Virginia Food and Drink Law, and it allows individuals to make and sell certain low-risk foods in their private home kitchen without state inspections as long as they follow the guidelines and restrictions in this section of the law. The list of allowable foods are in the following general categories, and we will get into them in subsequent, subsequent slides. Low-risk foods, certain home canned foods like pickles and acidified vegetables, and honey. On our website, we have a home kitchen food processing exemption fact sheet that also includes frequently asked questions and additional clarification of the exemption to help you guys along your way. Next slide, please. The low-risk food category includes candies, jams and jellies not considered low acid or acidified food products, dried items such as dried fruit, pasta, tea, herbs, seasonings, dry mixtures, and baking mixes, coated and uncoated nuts, vinegars and flavored vinegars, popcorn and popcorn balls, cotton candy, roasted coffee, cereals, trail mixes, granola, and baked goods that do not require time and temperature control after preparation. Examples of this are Cookies and cakes typically do not require time and temperature control after preparation, and these are allowable under the home kitchen exemption. However, something like a cheesecake or a meringue does require time or temperature control after preparation for, um, for safety, so those would not be allowed under the exemption. However, you could apply to get a permit through us and still be able to sell your products. And I also wanted to clarify here, that freeze-dried versions of the items already on the exemption list, as you see before you, are allowed under the exemption. Next slide, please. This is the next category, certain types of home canned foods. Pickles and acidified vegetables with a pH of 4.6 or lower. Acidified vegetable products include pickled products, salsa, chow chow, and relishes. It does not include things like barbecue sauce and extracts. The um, acidified foods must also comply with the 21 CFR 114 regulation and total gross annual sales must not exceed 3000 until July 1st, as Pam mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, effective July 1st, this will go up to 9,000. And this exempt category does not include canned fermented foods, canned foods that require refrigeration, canned acid foods, canned fruits, and low acid canned foods with a pH greater than 4.6. Next slide, please. Now, we've gone over the different foods that are allowed under the exemption, and now we're going to go over the criteria that um, vendors operating under the exemption and making those types of food need to also follow. The food products must be made in your own private home and sold at the home or at the farmer's market. Again, we have an asterisk here to remind us that effective July 1st, you will also be able to sell your products at temporary events that um, last no longer than 14 consecutive days. However, the other items in this criteria slide are still applicable. You must sell your products directly to the end consumer and not for resale, which means not selling them to other businesses. You must not offer them for sale over the internet or across state lines, and you must meet uh, mandatory labeling requirements as well as additional state labeling requirements, including your name, physical address, and phone number, the food production date, and the disclaimer statement not for resale, processed, and prepared without state inspection. Next slide, please. Honey is also one of our exempt products, but it is a little bit different than the rest of them, and it's in its own little subsection. 
you can make honey from your own hives um, under exemption from state inspection, provided it is only pure honey. Um, infused honey products are not exempt. And your annual sales do not exceed 250 gallons of honey. Again, if you wanted to make um, infused honey products or under other honey products or your sales exceed 250 gallons, you can do that. You just need to apply for a permit enabling um, in order to be able to do so. Your honey labels must meet mandatory labeling requirements just like any other food. And then it would also uh, include the statement process and prepared without state inspection. Warning, do not feed honey to infants under one year old. The other difference with honey um, under the exemption is that it can be sold retail as in direct to the consumer or wholesale, which means to other entities. So that makes it different from the other products that we just went over that are only allowed to be sold directly to the end consumer. Next slide, please. Now let's go over mandatory labeling requirements. In general, there are four main things that you wanna consider in the beginning of your, of your labeling process. You need to have a statement of identity, the common name of the product, what is it? As you see in the example label, the, the statement of identity is at the top and the product is chocolate chip cookies. The second thing is the ingredient list. This includes sub-ingredients, which means ingredients that make up other ingredients, such as in the example, you'll see the first ingredient is bleached, enriched, white wheat flour, and then in parentheses, it lists the sub-ingredients, also known as the things that make up that enriched wheat flour. And you'll also need to include your allergens, and we'll talk about allergens in, a, um, in the next slide, but your entire ingredient list, this is where you're comparing it to your recipe and listing your ingredients in order from most heavy to least heavy. So if you're looking at this chocolate chip cookie label, the main ingredient in here is the wheat flour that's listed first, and the very last ingredient is vanilla, which means there's not that much in there as compared to the flour. The third thing is your net, your net quantity statement in standard and metric units. As you see on the example label, we have net weight at the bottom, 10 ounces and 283 grams. You do need both of those units on there. And the fourth main um, thing for your mandatory labeling is the name and address of the manufacturer, packer, or, dis or distributor. Next slide, please. Okay, and these are the big nine allergens. For a very long time, there were eight reportable allergens in the U.S., and as of last year, the uh, sesame was added. So milk, eggs, fish, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, soybean, and sesame. You must make sure you declare all of those on your labels if they are in your product. Next slide, please. Nutritional labeling requirements are also um, applicable, but there are some exemptions that may apply and they do apply for a lot of our farmers market vendors in Virginia. Packaged food and dietary supplements must bear nutritional labeling, again, unless you qualify for an exemption. And there are two. If you have less than 10 employees and less than 10,000 units sold per item, you are exempt from nutrition fact, nutritional labeling and there's no need to file for an exemption. If you have less than 100 employees and less than 100,000 units sold per item, you can still be exempt, but you have to file an annual exemption notice with the FDA. Now, these exemptions, again, they apply to many of our farmer's market vendors, but if there are any nutrient or health claims on your product, such as low, low fat, fat free, sugar free, the exemption no longer applies. If you make any nutrient health claims or nutrient content or health claims, you have to have a nutritional label um, nutrition facts panel on your food label. As it says on the slide, the nutritional labeling exemption has no effect on mandatory labeling information discussed on the previous slide. So you will always need your common name, your net weight, your ingredients, your allergens, your name and address. You will always need that, but your nutritional labeling, it will depend on what you're doing and what claims you're making on your label, if any. Next slide, please. And again, as I mentioned before, as your business grows and changes, so will your products and labels. 
please send your labels to us re to, for review before you get them printed so we can help you make sure they're correct. And please remember to submit your new products for review and approval prior to offering them for sale. And I will pass it along to Karen for finishing the rest of our presentation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Bergen. I am a food safety manager with the Virginia Department of Agriculture, and I'm gonna continue on here. Eggs may be sold in Virginia without state inspection. Um, if you are selling up to 150 dozen eggs per week produced by your own hens, or up to 60 dozen eggs per week from another pr producer's hens. Eggs offered for sale at farmer's markets must be clean and unbroken, properly refrigerated at 45 degrees Fahrenheit or below, and properly labeled. The labeling requirements are the statement of identity, which is eggs, the net quantity, such as 12 eggs or one dozen, the business name and address, the appropriate grade or named ungraded if none, eggs labeled as fresh must meet grade A standards, and a free, keep refrigerated statement and safe food handling instructions. So this example here says, keep refrigerated at below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Safe food handling instructions to prevent illness from bacteria, keep eggs refrigerated, cook eggs until yolks are firm, and cook foods containing eggs thoroughly. Next slide. Foods that contain alcohol. A food cannot be sold in Virginia if it has more than 0.5% alcohol by volume. Anyone that wants to sell a product with alcohol in it must have the product tested for the alcohol content, and those test results must be submitted with your application. There is an exemption here that Virginia Alcohol Beverage Control, Virginia ABC, would regulate a food that has an alcohol content greater than 0.5% ABV as an alcoholic beverage or a product. Please contact the Virginia ABC to discuss your specific situation. We do know of um, a few applications that others have used in the past, and there are links here attached to our slide here for the uh, confectionery permit and a culinary permit. Next slide. If you're selling live chicks or animals, there are no limitations from our department regarding, regarding selling live animals at markets. If buying or reselling chicks, register as a poultry dealer with the Virginia Department of Agriculture Office of Veterinary Services, and there's a link here provided in our slide. Live animals cannot be sold within the food booth. You need to make sure that you maintain enough distance between live animals and the food to prevent contamination of the food. You need to provide separate employees for each area, one employee for handling the food and one employee for handling the live animals, and there must be access for hand washing. Next slide. Transporting food to the market, the food must be protected from contamination and under temperature control during transportation to and from the market. Food boxes, crates, the transportation vehicles, such as your trucks and vans, et cetera, should be cleaned and maintained in a sanitary condition. And temperature controlled vehicles should also have a display thermometer. Do a test run. This is a great example. If it takes you two hours to drive to the market, and the market is four hours long and it takes you two hours to get home, it's a total of eight hours. In this scenario, temperature control for safety food must be under temperature control for the entire eight hours. Next slide. And again, to remind you, the temperature controls, cold holding is 41 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Hot holding is 135 Fahrenheit or hotter. Use a probe style thermometer to check the internal temperature of temperature control for safety foods and keep display thermometers in your coolers. Ice and electrical slash gas powered equipment such as generators may be used provided acceptable temperatures are achieved. And when in doubt, throw it out. Next slide, please. Ice and ice packs may be used for temperature control of cold items provided accepted, acceptable temperatures are maintained 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. The ice must be drained frequently you do not want to store food in direct contact with the ice to avoid contamination. There is an exception for whole fruits and vegetables that may be stored on ice, but otherwise they should be in a container in the ice. Next slide. Recommendations is to bring an extra cooler full of just ice or ice packs. Bring that along with you on hot days. 
provide a picture of the items um, on your display table so your customers know what you're offering for sale without having to constantly open the cooler. And if you want the customers to see what your actual item is, you can provide display examples. Just label it, it's an example only and it's not for sale. And then the example, the display examples must be thrown away at the end of the day. Next slide. The Virginia Department of Agriculture has the uh, guidelines for providing safe food samples at the market. It's attached here onto our slide as a PDF, but it's also on our website. And it goes into detail into these seven categories of providing food safe, safe food samples at a market. So safe preparation and, and storage of your food, you need to use clean, use clean surfaces and utensils, ensure good personal hygiene, and proper storage, storage of prepared samples. You need to make sure you're keeping your hands clean and maintain a barrier between your hands and your food. You need to keep your equipment clean and limit the exposure time of your food that is left, left outside for less than for four hours or less if it's a temperature controlled for safety food. You need to ensure that your food is protected from the environment and you need to make sure you're protecting your allergic customers. Next slide. If preparing samples at the market, have a hand wash station on site. You'll also need to have on site a utensil and equipment cleaning station set up to wash, rinse, and sanitize. And it is recommended to use single service items whenever possible. Keep things cold, cold things cold, keep hot things hot. Have a sign or materials that inform customers of possible allergens. And as a best practice, prepare your samples in an approved inspected facility prior to arriving to the market. Next slide. Store your products in a clean, dry location where they're not exposed to splash, dust, or other contamination, and use covers or packaging to protect your products and samples from the elements, from pests, and from dirty fingers. We do encourage people to use sneeze guards or dome covers, but there are many creative ideas here too. Maintain a barrier between your hands and the food. Use tongs, spoons, gloves, toothpicks, ramkins, single-use deli papers. Uh, keep your equipment clean, use clean, and we do recommend disposable items, but be prepared to wash, rinse, and sanitize items that are not disposable. Also bring extras so you do not run out. Next slide. Thank you. Um, this is an example of a hand wash station, the cooler with a spout for water, the wastewater collection container, soap, paper towels, and a trash can. You need to practice good personal hygiene, including clean outer garments, effective hair restraints, and there's no smoking, eating, or drinking. Wash your hands frequently, especially after touching your body, your hair, or if you're coughing or sneezing. You need to wash your hands after using a handkerchief or eating and drinking. After using a restroom, if you're handling animals, using tobacco, handling dirty equipment or utensils, make sure you wash your hands after switching between using raw and ready to eat foods and also engaging in activities that contaminate your hands. Avoid bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. Use deli papers, spatulas, tongs, dispensing equipments, or disposable gloves. And next slide. This is an example of your three basin sink or your three compartment sink for wash, rinse, sanitize. Um, sanitizers must be approved for the sanit Proof for sanitizing food contact surfaces and use per the manufacturer's instructions. We have shared some pictures here of commonly used sanitizers, although we do not recommend a specific brand, but we want to show you that each uh, sanitizer has different properties and they do need the corresponding test strips. The test strips do measure the concentration of the sanitizer. So 50 to 100 parts per million of chlorine leach or you can use 200 to 400 parts per million of the quaternary ammonium. Next slide. I want to thank you for asking us to participate and for you guys being here to, to ensure that you're providing food safe, safe food to our communities. We are available through our food safety um, email box at foodsafety at bdax.virginia.gov and by phone and by emails. So thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have some questions in the Q&A, as well as we have a question, does honey require a nutrition label? No. 
No, it does not. Perfect. Thank you. And in the Q and A, um, how would you like to handle the questions here? Would y'all like to answer those by typing in answers or would you like for me to ask you the questions? There's quite a few. Yeah, I was gonna say there are quite a few. We've been trying to um, answer them as we go. We don't wanna take too much time um, away from the training. Okay. But if there are a few you wanted to go over verbally, we would absolutely do that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I see we've got some stuff on produce. We can let produce safety talk about that. Um, we've got some stuff regarding alcohol. We will have ABC um, here to join us next week. Um, ABC is actually on the last day, which is the 11th, and they will be answering all questions regarding boozy bunt cakes, selling wine or cider at a farmer's market, vanilla tinctures, et cetera. Um, is cultured buttermilk powder an allergen? I believe there's milk in the buttermilk. So yes, it would be. Okay. And then I'll ask, let's see one other. Um, why do some VDAX inspected businesses still have the older inspection certificates with no dates instead of the new food manufacturer's permits? Do they not get notified to update the food manufacturer's permits? We do send out our permits each year. We do a mass mailing. So that might just be a case where they haven't updated what they hang on the wall, but we do give them every year. Okay. Yeah, and I wanted to add, Kim, that yes. if you do not receive your permit, and we try to send it the week before July 1st so that you have it. If you do not receive them, give it about a month. I mean, we're mailing them, but please contact us and we can get you another one if you do not receive it in the mail. And you will get a permit every year, is that correct? Yeah, every yeah. July 1st. Okay. And the permit is for anybody that's under inspection? Correct. So yes. if you are a cottage baker or you're under cottage law, you do not receive a permit. If they're exempt. Yeah. yeah. They're exempt. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I know that you guys, a couple of y'all are going to stay on for the rest. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of your hard work in answering all of the questions beforehand as well as today. If y'all can um, go ahead and try and answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A, and we will circle back to any that um, you feel like you want to expand on after our next presenters, if that works for everybody. Yeah. Hey, Kim, I had hey, one last comment. Yes, ma'am. a question in the chat. Uh, I just want to uh, say that Megan Music is a technical specialist with the Food Safety Program, and she's in the chat answering your questions. Someone asked who Megan was. So she okay. For VDAX, and she's answering uh, the questions for VDAX. She's helping. She's doing a lot of it. So if you get your questions in there, she's been in there answering them all. Thanks, Megan. She so she's official. She is she's a right. she is an official, she's uh, official. <laughs> person representing VDAX, and she is answering those questions for us. Got I really question. appreciate it. Thank One you so much. One more thing regarding the Q and A, please. Um, so I'm noticing some questions coming in under responses that have already been made. And those are hard to keep up with. So please put your new questions in as a new question and not in response to something that one of the panelists has already responded to. We're trying to pull those sub questions out and get them answered, but it's hard to, hard to find them. And I guess the last, um, thank you so much, Carrie, I appreciate it. Um, the last, uh, question that I will ask because I see there are a couple of questions about it regarding the approval process. Um, what is the, and you may have stated this, and I'm sorry if I missed it, what is the turnaround time now for approval of small businesses for their products? We provide an estimate about right now, eight to 10 weeks. We okay. are a small team and we have a high volume of applications and it is likely that your application will be approved quicker than that or longer depending on the specialty of your products so we'd like to provide the eight to ten weeks as a general estimate of what to expect when you first apply and thank you and can i ask you to expand for a moment because we see this a lot at the virginia farmers market association where people will submit one or two items 
for their initial inspection, and they think that automatically qualifies them for any additional products that they are making. Say, for example, um, you're making a flavored kombucha, as, a, as an example, and you approve berry, but now I'm developing multiple other flavors. Do I need to get those inspected also? Um, or if I am making chocolate chip cookies, and well, that's a bad example because that falls under. Um, okay, but I am making I'm I am making one product that falls under inspection. Does that automatically qualify any additional products that I'm making to be approved, or do I need to get them approved? No, each one would need to be approved separately. So each flavor um, and variation. Thank you. I know we see that quite a bit where folks think that they have, um, you know carte blanche approval for all products once they get that that certificate. But any new products, any new recipes have to be approved. Yes, ma'am. We keep copies of those on their file with us. So if they, sometimes people end up with a lot of products and they kind of forget what's been approved and what's not. If you ever need confirmation of what we have on file, please just send us an email and we'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and thank y'all for looking at the questions and for Megan jumping on all of those questions. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on with, um, we're gonna hear from Produce Safety and we're gonna hear from Christina Banks, uh, Produce Safety Specialist, uh, Senior of the VDAX Produce Safety Program. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Christina. Please feel free to continue to drop all your questions in the Q&A for VDAX and VDH, and we will get to them as soon as possible. Thank you. Christina, take it away. So thank you, Kim, and for that introduction. I'm going to share with you guys today the information about our produce safety program. It's a regulatory program that addresses the growing, packing, holding, and foraging of produce on farms that encourages, encourages the safe production of fruits and vegetables, and promotes an understanding of compliance with FDA, FDA produce safety rule. It's 21 CFR part 112. Okay. So I've just got my information here. If you guys would like to contact me, I have my email here, my cell phone number. You guys can contact me directly with any questions you may have. And I think that you'll be able to get that dropped in the box too as well. Right here, we have our map that's just kind of showing our locations and our locality. I'm in the purple location and I'm located in Carroll County, but I, I'll cover all of the purple counties. So if you're located in any of those counties, you can reach out to me. The yellow area is Cynthia Mohan. And currently we have an empty area in the pink area. That's our central area, but we are working on currently fill on that location. So we have six key requirements of the produce safety rule. It focuses on the microbial risk and is divided into subparts. We have agriculture water, biological soil amendments, sprouts, domesticated and wild animals, worker training and health hygiene, equipment, tools and buildings. And as we are regulating the whole the whole issue, the whole point that we try to work with you guys is we try to educate the farmers while we're trying to gain voluntary compliance with the produce safety rule. Oh, let's go back here. So does every produce farm in Virginia need to be inspected? We get that question quite often. The inspections are mandatory for any farm that is covered and that will grow, harvest, forage, or pack, cover produce under the rule. We'll talk about what a covered farm is in just a minute. Sprout inspections are conducted jointly with FDA and VDAX, and the coverage is determined by a three-year gross sales average on a threshold that increases with inflation. I believe these links will be dropped in our, in our chat, and you'll have that chart here in just a minute as well. We also use an FDA decision tree to determine that coverage and exemption and we're gonna go through that FDA decision tree together because we still have a lot of questions on that FDA tree. So this sheet right here is gonna be linked, I believe on our website, but it's also on the FDA homepage. 
This is the inflation sheet. We're not going to spend a lot of time going on this sheet because we can get really lost on this one. If you like here, you can take like a screenshot of this one. But again, the link is going to be linked for you guys to look at this later. But what this does is just showing you like the baseline of where the farms were cut off as far as the dollar amount. But it changes every year. Like when we started the program, you know, in 2011, then every year with inflation is going to change for the dollar amount. Again, if you want to take a snapshot of this, you can go back and look at this later. And then when you will go to our portal, which we'll talk about in just a minute, it's going to help you walk through this so you can help make that decision of where you are at as far as monetary. And that helps you decide of what size farm you are. This is the FDA coverage and exemption flowchart. And we are going to kind of walk through this together in steps. We'll start at the top of it. And just, this is going to help you decide, like, am I covered? You know, these are the questions that we get asked quite a bit. And again, this is also on our portal. And you would go through these questions one by one on, the, on our portal. So starting at the top, if you were to work through this, and these are the questions that we would ask you, too, when we talk to you. You know, we start at the top and we'll say, does your farm grow, harvest, pack, or whole produce? And if no, then your farm is not covered. That would be your first question. If yes, then you would continue. So does your farm on an average and last previous three years have $25,000 or less in annual produce sales? Again, if no, you would continue. And then if, if yes, your farm is not covered by the rule. So you would continue again. Is your produce one of the commodities that FDA has identified as a rarely consumed raw? And so what that kind of means, you would have some questions again on the portal and it would say like rarely consumed raw may be corn or sweet corn or, or collard. So it's gonna ask you some of those questions of what, that's why it's really important to know like exactly what you grow. And then if it's no, you would continue. If yes, you would not be covered, but it would be only so those are going to be some questions you'd have to work through. Is your produce for personal, oh, sorry about that. I'm just continuing with that. So is your produce for personal or on-farm consumption? So if you're just growing it for yourself and your family, then in, you would not be covered by the rule. If no, you would continue. Is your produce intended for commercial processing that adequately reduces pathogens? For example, like commercial processing with a kill step. That would be something like wine or um, maybe tomatoes for uh, tomato paste. So again, to the right, if you look, it says this process is eligible for exemption, but there's some small print and you would have to show us that you would have the documentation that you would keep. So we'll continue. So this is the bottom of the decision tree. Does your farm on an average in the previous three years have five under, I mean, sorry, over $500,000 in annual food sales and a majority of the food by value sold directly to qualified end users? So to the right, if it's yes, your farm is eligible. I'm saying under, I'm so sorry, under. So if yes, your farm is eligible for qualified exemption. So again, you would have to have some documents showing that you would be qualified for that annual exemption. So these things, like I said, can get quite confusing. And I'm gonna skip this bottom part about the qualified end user because I do have a slide that's gonna talk about the qualified end user because I wanna elaborate on that and give you some examples. I do wanna show you though, on here where it talks about food. Food is defined in the FD and C Act as articles used for food and drink for man or other animals, chewing gum, articles used for components of any such article. So food can be definitely quite broad. So that, that's a definition that's given to us by FD and C. So again, I'm gonna explain to you about the qualified end user in just a minute. Here is a list of some examples of produce that is covered. FDA determines this list and they define them as raw agriculture commodities. The highlighted ones on here are common ones that I, like I see when I'm out on inspections. You know, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a list again that we see common. 
I'm going to point out, for instance, the mushrooms I heard on the VDH in the beginning. I heard somebody ask a question about mushrooms. And again, I want to elaborate on it. Maybe we can talk about it and you guys can drop your questions in about the mushrooms. But, you know, if you were growing mushrooms on the farm, foraged or farm raised, they would be considered a covered produce. And again, that would be based on the annual sales. And that's going to be depending on going through that coverage chart. So you could possibly look at our portal. We'll talk about it in here in a second. And you could go through the portal to see if you would be considered a covered farm or not. So that's something that we're seeing a lot of the mushrooms. Um, let's see what else. The herbs, the herbs, wild or, or farms, we're seeing, you know, that's been a rise of like, I would say like the herb hubs, those are going to be a growing operation that we're seeing. Microgreens is another one that we're seeing a lot. It's becoming quite popular. We'll continue. But this, so again, this is a list and you can find that. Um, let's see. Sorry, I got distracted. You can find that at the, tw at the top where it says 21 CFR 112.1. You can go and get, that's where you can get this list. All right. What some, so what produce is not covered by the rule is there's some, there's some produce that receives commercial processing that we talked about on the previous slide that reduces the presence of microorganisms. And again, some examples were the tomatoes processed for tomato paste or produce grown by an individual for personal consumption. That's not covered by the rule or produce that is rarely consumed raw. And again, some of those examples would be if you only grow corn, collards, pumpkins, or beets. So that, those are just some examples of what's not covered by the rule. And then if you are covered by the produce safety rule, rule, some records that would be required would be records to support the coverage for the exemptions that we talked about. Records for training would be required. Records for the, just the post-harvest ag water for large farms. Records for biological soil amendments. If, if you are using them, records for sanitation of equipment, tools, and buildings. And the PSA has done a really great job of creating records that meet all those requirements that can be downloaded. And those logs are available to use and word format, and you can download those. So all records are required that are required, they must contain certain information like the name and location of the farm, actual values and observations, the date and the time of the activity documented, an adequate description of the cover produce, be created at the time of the activity that it was performed. They all must be dated, signed, and initialed by the person who performed the activity. And they must be reviewed, dated, signed within a reasonable time after the records are made by a supervisor or a responsible party. Let's get it. Okay. So if you do want to be eligible for a qualified exemption that we talked about, you must keep certain records that you performed an annual review of the verification of your farm's continued eligibility, the records necessary to just demonstrate that the farm satisfies the criteria. And the majority of the food sales go to a qualified end user. So that's where we're gonna talk about what that qualified end user is. And also keep the data sales receipts. So what is a qualified end user? It's the consumer of a food or individual, not a business, or it could be a restaurant or other retail food establishment that is located either in the same state or same Indian reservation as the farm that produced the food or not more than 275 miles from the farm. A farm stand would be an example. A farmer's market would be an example. A community supported ag culture, a customer as well as a restaurant, a grocery store and a food cooperative. So definitely if you guys are selling to the farmer's markets like we're talking about a lot of you guys now, that would be considered a qualified end user. So underneath that decision tree, you know, if you're selling and you're underneath those certain dollars, you may think about if a lot of you guys are selling just to a farmer's market, that would be a qualified end user. But if you're selling to a distributor, a repack center, a wholesaler, a food hub, they do not include I mean, this does not include restaurants or a retail food establishment located more than 275 miles away from the farm. This is not a qualified end user. So if we've got like local food hubs, like um, the one out thinking um, 
Appalachian sustainability. That one does not. I'm trying to think. There's there is another one in the middle of the state. Forgive me right now, but I can't think of them. But they are not going to be considered a qualified end user. The portal, I keep talking about that. I say go to the portal and register, you know, and go through the registration process and go walk work through that chart. That's what this is here. You may have seen these flyers and these postcards floating around. So this is our portal that was created for growers to self-verify and register your farm on this platform. And you can apply for exemptions, but you can also register here. You'll be able to print out certificates and show your consumers and restaurants that, you know, you have that one that you care about your product, that you do want to show them that you're doing everything that, you know, VDAX is asking you to do. And, you know, you'll also be able to print out the certificates to show them that you'll have a registration exemption. I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Currently, we have several hundred farms using this portal. And when you go to register, you'll be entered into the Virginia Grown database as well. The registration is a one-time activity, but the exemption process is not. It's required yearly, and the certificate does expire. When you do register, you'll receive like you'll safety updates, FDA water updates. You'll receive information about our PSA classes. Your certificate will look like this if you did get a one for an exemption. So it'd be beneficial to show your farmer's market managers, or you could use it for, you know, selling to restaurants. If like, for instance, Department of Health asked, you know, information about, um, are you doing, I, I'm not sure, like if you're selling to a food truck or, you know, different things like that, you could show them that you are doing what you're asked to do. This is the one if you're certifying for registration. So if you are being under inspection, you could still use this one right here because underneath the Department of Ag for Produce Safety, we don't actually issue certificates. Like the Department of Health, they will issue a permit. We actually issue inspections. So if you're inspected, you can, you know, you would still be able to get this one. If you do an exemption, you would get both. You would get exemption and registration. So the talking about the training. If you are a covered farm, you would have to have one type of training. Your your um, excuse me, your supervisor or your operator would have to have this standardized food training program, and it would be the Produce Safety Alliance training course. Fortunately, we have a training coming up, and that's going to be with Virginia Tech and BCE. They partnered to be able to offer this class for $35. It's gonna be offered via Zoom. The next course is gonna be May 1st. It's gonna be two half day class or two half day classes, yes, for four hours each day. And this class is the one that, again, is gonna be, you don't have to have this class unless you're a covered farm, again. Some people do take it because they like to have it and this is gonna give you a certificate and you can contact Dr. Laura Strong to register for this class. So being proactive and how can you be proactive to, you know, prepare for an inspection? Just consider contacting your local extension agent to get a free on-farm readiness review. You would then contact, I mean, conduct a mock inspection, you know, run through a produce inspection. They can help determine your readiness for an inspection and help to see if you had any potential violations. Also, there are a lot of resources available to use. Like I was talking about the PSR compliant logs. There's a web tool also, if you were using any type of sanitizers for your produce, that's brand new. That's really easy to use. You can put in what sanitizers you're, do, you're using or what, what sanitizers you'd like to use. And, you know, they can help you with that, decide which one would be available. There's training resources on the Produce Safety Alliance page as well. And any grower can take advantage of that OFRR program. The main goal really is to help the small and very small farmers to be aware of the new law and what to expect from VDAX. Again, there's no charge for this. And what is the difference between a VDAX inspection and a gap audit? We get this question quite a lot. So the VDAX inspections are mandatory if you are a covered farm. The gap audits are voluntary. There's fees associated with the gap audit. 
and there's no fees with an inspection. A state and an FDA or slash FDA inspector conducts the FISMA PSR inspections, and a USDA with slash state conducts the gap audits. And a food safety plan is required for a gap audit. There is no food safety plan required for a VDEX inspection, but both requires record keeping. There's a nice document that's been created with AFTO here that there'll be a link for that's a couple pages long that you can look at to see the main differences. And there's some information about our water rule coming up. Well, it's it's new, it's I'd say coming up, but there's gonna be, uh, there's a lot of changes that are going on that if you may have heard about with our water, our post-harvest water. So currently our compliance dates for harvest and post-harvest ag water are in effect. So January 26th, 2023 for large farms and 26, January 26, 24 for small farms is going to be educational this year. And then January 26, 25 for our small farms. And they, this again is for harvest and post-harvest, but this is going to be for covered farms only. So this is what water on farms may look like. To the left, we just have some water, ag water from some ponds. And then to the right, we have a well head that has obviously been broken. Those are some things that we look at on the farm, some inspection things that we possibly would look at at a farm, just some pictures to think about. And another water use in the field, it looks like some post-harvest activities. So full disclosure here, the pictures are just to show ag water use and they're not saying it's correct or incorrect use. And what's the difference in post-harvest water and pre-harvest water? So pre-harvest water activities would be overhead sprinkler, spray, micro, furrow, flood, seepage, sub-irrigation, pesticides, herbicides, prop sprays. And what we're looking at for the co compliance would be post-harvest activities, not, not the pre-harvest, with dump tanks, flumes, cooling water, wash water, hand washing water, cleaning water. So those are some of the differences. And I think that helps break down like what some, I, I think problem, I say problems, but questions we get a lot in the field, like what are the differences? And one big question we always have is, is hand washing post-harvest and definitely hand washing and cleaning water are post-harvest activities. So requirements for harvest and post-harvest ag water, again, for cover produced for large and small farms for covered. So if you are covered by the water rule, I put this all on one slide and it's a bit wordy, but I wanted just to put it all on one slide. And if you, this would be a good opportunity if you were thinking that you're covered or you may be covered just to snap a picture of this because these are would be all the requirements. The main requirement for all farms though is that you have safe, adequate and sanitary quality for its intended use. That would be like all water should be safe. But if you are covered, you would have an inspection and maintenance and a log would be required one time annually. And then if you're using any type of treatment, you would need a log for that. Um, then the you would you would have um, corrective measures if you need it. Again, you can't use any on treated surface water, and then you must ensure that there is no detectable generic E. coli of ag water. And if you're using a public supply certificate of compliance, would be asked like one we would ask to see that one time a year. And then if you're using any groundwater, initially we would just ask that you test it four times during the growing season, then one time after. And again, and that's just every year after that, you would just do one time. And if you're monitoring any type of water treatment, like flumes or anything like that, you would have to show the, those records and the PSA templates. Again, like I said, they have already used, I mean, created, you could use those templates. And here are a few links that we have. I believe that they will be available for you guys to have. The top one right there is just the proposed rule that was showing all of the information about the ag water, but now it is in effect. But 
Then the next, the PSA Ag Water Inspection Fact Sheet, just showing how that water and system inspection sheet is different than the, um, let's see, that is a, cre a creation from Party Safety Alliance. And the post-harvest fact sheet is a really good document because it's just going to go over all of the requirements that I just talked about on that one slide. And the Ag Water Assessment is, they have an online version and a paper version. As you see, it's 33 pages. It's also available in Spanish, but the online is pretty simple. It just helps you start thinking about risk on your farm water. So in summary, again, just start thinking about or actually conduct a water assessment if you are selling produce. It's definitely not required right now, but it's a useful tool. And that's the tool I was just had showed you a link up. If you are selling produce, you can use that VDAX produce safety portal to register your farm so you can keep up with updates through our email list and also take benefits of using, you know, getting those certificates to see how that would help your farm. Use the FDA decision tree to help to decide if your farm will need to have an inspection. And then you can also apply for exemptions on that portal. The PSR is mandatory to comply with are under FISMA for covered produce farms, and it's not the same as third-party audits that are market-driven. And then use your resources available to you, like contact your extension office and visit our Produce Safety Alliance website because we have a ton of resources and reach out to us with any questions. So with further ado, that's our website. You can reach out again. We have lots of, lots of resources on our page and I am finished and I have time for questions and Eric Bongo is on here too. So if we, anything I can't answer, he's available as well. And we will definitely be on for the rest of the presentations. Christina, thank you so much. Um, Eric and your cohorts have been awesome in jumping into the chat and answering the questions that are in there regarding produce safety um, as it relates to small farms. Um, we also have some questions in the chat regarding VDAX food safety requirements that fall under Rochelle and Karen and Pam. Um, and so I'm sure that they will be hopping on and answering those. Um, let's see the questions about how to start a farmer's market. I love you guys that want to start a farmer's market. Reach out to me and we will talk about that at another time. Um, let's see, there was something in here today about, um, let me see, uh, on farm, um, on farm events. And that is a VDAX question, hot sauce, that's VDAX, um, cottage law, that's VDAX. So it looks like your cohorts have captured all of the questions that were in the chat. Any last questions regarding produce safety? gap as it relates to produce safety, what's exempt, what's not, what the threshold is, et cetera. Um, to reiterate for all of you that are asking all of the, um, not only will all of the presentations, the, the live recordings, as well as all of the PowerPoint decks, all of the resources and links, all of their contact information, the FAQs, as well as all of the questions that are in the Q&A and their answers will all be sent out it's going to um, within the next two weeks. So expect that it will come out to the email address that you registered. We also will post the information on our food safety website uh, component on the VAFMA website. So as well as it'll be posted on the presentations will ultimately be posted on YouTube. Any last questions for Christina while we have her before we turn it over to weights and measures? Thank you, Christina. I so appreciate it. Um, as always, it was fantastic. Thank you all for all that you do. And um, I appreciate that you will stay on and grab any questions that are dropped into the chat. And um, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, so next, we're going to hear from Gary Milton. Gary is the program manager of Weights and Measures. And I thank you, Gary, so much for being with us today. Uh, always something that we get a lot of questions about and very important. So I really appreciate you pickling um, your schedule so you could join us today. This is really appreciated. Uh, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Okay. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. All right. 
Yeah, probably. Let me see. Ah. Everyone see that? You're good. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Gary Milton. I'm with the Office of Weights and Measures on the VDAX. And um, I always like to take a op little opportunity to tell you about the Office of Weights and Measures. We're responsible for uh, regulation of commercial weighing and measuring devices. We also um, have some other activities under our office, but for the weighing and measuring devices, we do scales, everything from jewelry scales to uh, vehicle scales, everything in between. We do meters, which would be anything from propane meters to vehicle tank meters to gas pumps. We inspect those. We also do point of sale inspections for uh, especially the barcodes. If you go into a store and they scan barcodes, that price that's advertised has to match the price that is at the register. We do check weighing activities, which go in maybe grocery stores, any packaged product. We can go in and weigh and check to make sure that the weight is accurate on the product. Uh, we also collect fuel samples. We do almost 5,000 fuel samples every year, and we send those over to the uh, fuel lab at uh, DCLS to be checked. And we also handle a lot of complaints. We do four to 500 complaints a year. But today we're focusing on what affects you as a, in the farmer's market, so I'll move on into that. If my computer will let me. Uh oh. Let's see. There we go. Uh, some of the topics I'm going to discuss today types of sale, methods of sale, labeling, and last but not least, the one we get to questions on the scales. Uh, for types of sale, we look at two in the Office of Weights and Measures a direct sale versus a prepackaged sale. Uh, direct sale, basically, the individual may select items to be weighed, they're weighed, presented for sale, and they can select them from the bulk. Consumers may, may select the product, or you may put it on the scale and weigh it in front of them. Uh, Prepackaged scales are those those items that are prepackaged and displayed for sale. They will include a label, and I will get a little bit more into what the Office of Weights and Measures requires for labels in just a few minutes. Uh, move on here, and just uh, show you an example of the direct sale on the left side. You see the uh, scale there with the display facing the consumer. That's one thing that is required in the direct sale. And then on the right, you see these products that are labeled and prepackaged for display for sale. So the big, big difference is a label is required for prepackaged items. Uh, as I said, direct sale, no label is required by the Office of Weights and Measures. Items may be sold by weight, count, by measure. And if you use scales to uh, sell items by weight, then they must be compliant with the requirements, which I'll cover a little bit later. Prepackaged items, label is required. Product either must contain your stated net quantity whether it's in weight, volume, measure, count. And if it's by weight, a tear must be taken. And I will explain the tear just a little bit later as well. Uh, tear weight means the weight of the wrapper or package that is not actually part of the commodity. And that must be deducted from the label weight. And just tells you net weight down there means the actual weight of the item. No wrapping material is included in that. So moving on to methods of sale. And this is how certain commodities are sold. And this is directly from the Code of Virginia. 
um, just says that they may be sold by weight, measure, liquid measure. Uh, you can sell them by count. And it just gives you all the specifics for items. And we also, and I'll get to that in just a second, our handbook, we use National Institute of Standards and Technology Handbook 130, which has a method of sale as well. And that is in the slide here. So we use that for our enforcement for methods of sale. So if you have any questions, you can certainly let this office know about the methods of sale. And this is from the back of handbook 130, which gives you a specific commodity here, which is, is listed uh, and tells you how those items can be sold. Uh, one, I always point out corn on the cob, you can either sell it by weight or dry measure. Um, different different items, different commodities can be sold in different methods, some multiple methods, some specific methods. And then on the next page, we have general commodity groups, which give you just an overall view of, of what, how things can be sold. So those, like I said, are in Handbook 130. This is directly from Handbook 130. And if you have any questions on those, please let our office know. We will be glad to help you determine the best method of sale. Labeling. The Office of Weights and Measures also requires labeling, as well as some of the other programs. Uh, the information to be shown on the label for the Office of Weights and Measures are basically three things. We call them uh, the identity of the commodity, the quantity of the commodity, and then the declaration of responsibility for that commodity. And this again is from the Code of Virginia that lays out uh, the requirements for labeling. And then we also adopt in Handbook 130, Uniform Regulation for Package and Labeling. And just a little bit more on the labeling for the declaration of identity, what is the product? What is the standard name of that product? It can be uh, something specific that may be required by another program, FDA or USDA, or it can be a uh, generic type name with a qualifier. Uh, declaration of quantity, how much product, uh, weight, volume, or count has to be on there. And then the declaration of responsibility of who made the product, who's responsible for the product. For the declaration of identity, it must appear on the principal display panel and gives you a little bit of idea of the principal display panel there. And again, is the name required by federal or state regulations, common, usual name, generic name, or other appropriate description? So just, you know, whatever identifies the product as to what it is. Uh, declaration of quantity kind of goes into a little bit more of that, that gives you a, uh, appears on the 30, lower 30% 30 of the principal display panel. Uh, must be conspicuous when it's looked at and can include both uh, international units or metric units and customary un U.S. customary units. And for the declaration of responsibility, if it's displayed, then you need to have that on there unless it's produced where you are displaying it for sale. So if you're producing it there at the farmer's market, you probably don't need it. But if you're producing off-site, bringing it there to sell, you will. Uh, includes a name, address, uh, city and state. And if somebody else is packing it, 
and you're displaying it for sale, it can be either manufactured for or packed by or distributed by. So it needs to be on there. Just who has the basic responsibility for that product? Uh, before I move on to that, I will tell you, you know, Office of Weights and Measures requires a basic labeling. Some of your other programs may require more specific labeling. So certainly check with whoever you may fall under for that, but just for basic labeling, you know, those three items will meet what's required by the Office of Weights and Measures. Scales. This is one we get the questions on the scales. What's required for scales? Must be legal for trade. And that means they uh, meet certain standards as set forth by the National Conference on Weights and Measures. And in a nutshell, what that means, we adopt Handbook 44, which is a NIST publication uh, for National Conference. And it lays out what general um, qualities a scale must have. It also must be national type evaluation program approved. So that means they go through a, a certification to make sure the scales are accurate. They do what they're supposed to do. And they'll be a mark class three scales. So once they meet that, then they can be used for trade. And most of them will come with a certificate. Once they've gone through the NTEP program, they will come with a certificate of conformance. So you can look for that certificate of conformance number. A lot of times we get questions, or you know, I've got bathroom scales that I'm using, or you know, postal scales or portion scales. Those generally are not legal for trade and cannot be used for the wing of the product. Now, one caveat is that if you're going to prepackage product, we really don't worry about the scale uh, as much, but that package must contain the stated net weight. So we highly recommend if you're going to be weighing product offsite and labeling it, make sure your scales are legal for trade scales. Uh, some more specifications. Again, this comes from the Code of Virginia, and it references NIST Handbook 44. So that's where we get our authority to check scales and ensure that those scales meet the requirements. And here are some of the general requirements from Handbook 44. Uh, and it applies to commercial weighing and measuring equipment. Suitability of equipment, you know, whatever you're weighing or measuring, you want a scale suitable to weigh or measure that item or that product. Whatever you're selling, you want to make sure it's suitable. Identification, again, it goes back to the certificate of conformance, and these will all be listed as a, a C of C. And then one we get a lot of times is position of equipment. Again, if you're providing direct sales to consumers, that scale needs to be positioned so the consumer can see you see you weighing and see what that weight is at the time of sale. And again, uh, class three scales, and these will cover most anything anyone's going to use, especially at a farmer's market. And scales can be purchased from a registered service agency, which we uh, certify those in the state. Or you can purchase it on the internet. Just make sure if you do that it meets the requirements for legal for, sa legal for sale scale or legal for trade scale. And we encourage people a lot of times if you have a question, you're looking at something, please contact us. We will be glad to take a look to see that it meets the requirements. And I know I went through pretty quick, but any questions uh, coming for the Office of Weights and Measures? Well, thank you for asking, Gary. Yes, we do have some questions in the chat box for you. Okay. 
first and foremost, are you able to drop a link to the handbook that you mentioned um, into the Q&A or the chat so that we can send that out? I, um, will, I believe you hmm? I will see if I can. That may be, uh, and, and I would have to see, that may be something that is going to be for those who have access into or uh, a part of NCWM. Okay. That's a number, but again, questions okay. or if you've got concerns and need something specific, please contact this office and we will certainly help you find that information. Okay, we had a question specifically around commodities, so they should just reach out to you directly right. and we will make sure that we have your contact information and all. Yes, I've got so, it on the next slides. Thank you. Um, and I have a couple of other questions for you. Okay. The, um, are there any requirements on the size of the font on the label? Uh, there are a few and basically, and I would have to look and see exactly what the, what the code says, but it needs to be legible. Okay. It needs to be easily re readable. Okay. Uh, let's see. We also have a question. If, um, we have a vendor that offers that often bands together a handful of tournaments, tournament, oh my goodness, a handful of turnips or radishes, and they sell them as a bunch in a given price, or they sell blackberries in a bowl or a small basket. Are these considered packaged at this point? Uh, are they, if they're direct sales, no. Okay, so if they're selling retail, they're not considered packaged. Right. If they they you know handing them right in front of the consumer, then no, that to me that would be a direct sale. Okay. If they were packaged up, you know, it it would be different. But if they are not packaged, no. Okay. If selling by dry measure, does this still require a label? Uh, again, are they prepackaged or are they is a direct sale for the consumer? Okay. That's if the attendee that put the question in the um, Q and A would like to expand on that, we'd be happy to get that answer for you. Okay. Um, where can I get my scale certified in Albemarle County? And if the scale is labeled as class three, do we need additional inspection certification? Well, I would put it this way. We, in fiscal year 23, our inspectors visited 36 farmers markets. Okay. They and they busy. met with 180 vendors and checked 421 scales. Okay. So check with your farmers market. If a lot of the farmers markets will set up with our program to have a day or two days set aside where the vendors can bring the scales in to be checked. And yeah. I got our inspectors will certainly be glad to check them. And they will, they approve them, they'll apply, apply approval sticker. Uh, in the state of Virginia, we do not have a frequency for the inspections. So it's, you know, it's kind of, kind of as, as we get to them. But certainly the farmers markets, we we gladly come out and meet so we can check the scales. Thank you. I know uh, firsthand that a lot of market managers bring you in for their vendor meetings and mm -hmm. um, have you guys, you know, as one of the, uh, you know, have you there inspecting the scales. Um, but just to clarify what you just said, Gary. So. Are you saying that scales do not have to be inspected every year? No, they do not have to be inspected every year. Okay, but, so there's yes, you know, I would I I would suggest, you know, especially if they've moved around much to have them inspected as often as you can because what we always find is scales can be, you know, in favor of the consumer or they can be in favor of the business equally. So nobody wants to give product away. Okay. Uh, somebody has asked, can you please, uh, do you have a link or a recommendation of where you can purchase inspected scales or these types of scales? No, I really don't. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people ask that question and I just, you know, 
tell them to do an internet search, kind of figure out what you want. They're all registered service agents in the state of Virginia, which can help with the scales. If you would like to purchase one from them, or you can go on the internet and look. Again, I just ask if you are going to do the internet, Please, once you find something before you purchase, please let our office know to make sure that it's going to meet what your needs are and it's going to be compliant with the regulations. And I will just say for all of our participants, I have found Gary Milton and his office to be very responsive and very quick to respond, um, as does uh, the, our other partners that are on this call. But if you just shoot his office an uh, email, um, they will be happy to help you before you make that purchase. Um, I have a couple of other questions for you, Gary. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, do you include the wording net weight? Yes. Okay. Uh, if the market owner doesn't schedule someone to come inspect their scales, folks should just reach out to you to have, or to your office to have an inspector yes. come out? Yes. Okay. And, and a lot, we do have that on occasion that, Someone will contact us that wants to go to a farmer's market that may not have gone to the meeting, and we will try to set up with our inspector to have meet with them somewhere to inspect the scales. Okay. And so uh, we have somebody here that says it's the market manager's responsibility to get the scales inspected. It is the vendor's responsibility to get the scales inspected, to make sure mm -hmm. their scales are inspected and certified. Um, but what I was saying is a lot of market managers will arrange to have the Office of Weights and Measures come out at one time to the market and do everybody's scales at once. But no, it is not the market manager's responsibility. It is the uh, each vendor's responsibility. Um, Gary, one more here. If cut grains are being weighed and bagged at the farmer's market, are labels required? Are they going to be displayed for sale that in that manner? It yes. Yes, are they going to be directly? They going to be weighed prior to uh, being sold. I mean, I, so, well, I know this is kind of an ambiguous. So, if you have microgreens that are being cut right there, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the microgreen flat, and then they're being put in a bag, um, they're being they have explain what you would do there. I would say if they're going to be in a bag and you're going to weigh them, I'm assuming they will be sold by weight. Right. So if you're going to weigh them there in front of the customer, no, they do not need a weight on them, but you do have to deduct the tear. Okay. I have a question regarding the difference, and this may be somebody else besides you. It may have trickled over, but let me see if I can find it. Why do Why do mushrooms need to be labeled? If it's if mushrooms are being sold in a box the same as strawberries or blueberries, et cetera, why do mushrooms need to be labeled and fruit does not? That may be somebody else. All right. That may be a Pam Miles and her people's right. question. All right. Yeah. Can we I have Eric? Uh Eric, are you on to answer that? I know you received that question. Is he still here? All yeah. right, so I, I think I answered that question. Did I not, Kim? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to remember the questions that I had missed. I apologize. Now that I've put it out there, can you answer it live for us? Yeah, sure. Right. Go, go ahead. Go ahead and just repeat it again so I get you the best answer possible. Why Why do mushrooms require, if mushrooms are being sold in a box the same as strawberries or blueberries, why do they need a label and strawberries and fresh strawberries and blueberries do not? So again, we have to be, it's an open package here. Okay. So it's not required to have a label on it until it's an enclosed package form. All right. So I think when I answer the question, if it's loose, if it's loose and it's kind of in that, in that box, you need to have a, or a container, you need to have a placard somewhere there that says what the species or type of mushroom it is. Again, this just helps avoid a regulatory confusion. There are a lot of concerns with, you know, wild forage species and poisonous lookalikes. Um, Again, we also ask the same thing for strawberries. You know, if you obviously a strawberry is a strawberry, but there's a lot more concerns with mushrooms out there. Um, again, they all look different. So again, just having a placard there with what type of mushroom it is and that it's somehow indicate that it's cultivated or farm raised is in your best interest. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And 
let's see, one of the last questions that I think that we have for um, Gary, um, back to the original question about cut greens being weighed and bagged at the farmer's market. And I use the example of microgreens. Mm -hmm. The vendor has asked, if I have a bin of loose cut spinach, for example, um, does that, uh, what is required regarding bagging and weighing that and labeling at a market? Uh, and I'll have to look back as in, into handbook 130 and see how that can be sold. Is it, let me just give me one second. Let me flip back through here. Okay. And I'm seeing if it's anything specific. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I don't see anything specific as far as spinach. Okay. But uh, leafy vegetables can be sold by, you know, weight, head, or bunch or dry measure. So, you know, how you determine you want to sell it, then you can sell it that method. So Weight, you, bunch, dry measure. Them. And what was the last one? Did you say by head? Head, bunch, or dry measure. Okay. So, you know, you have a, a standard container you want to sell it, say, quart or so, you could do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me make sure okay. I captured that correctly. And could you... Could you please explain net content statement? As to how, how much is actually in there minus any tear or any packaging material that is net content. I think it was on one of the slides that explained the net content. So it's whatever, if it, again, if we're talking about spinach, for example, it's how much it, does the it, spinach weigh, not anything that it's wrapped around or the package it's in. Correct. Correct. Okay. Net, net is the actual consumable item. Okay. Perfect. Did I capture everybody's questions for Gary? Um, oh, wait, I have another one. Sorry. It jumped on after I thought I was done. Gary, if lettuce package is open and has a placard for description and weight per pound, does that need to be labeled? If, say that again. Okay. So if the lettuce package is open, and sitting, I would assume it means sitting on the table next to it, there's a placard that describes the uh, type of lettuce and the weight per pound. Does that need a label on the package? Again, you know, it's direct sale versus prepackaged sale. I'm assuming that would be a direct sale if the consumer is picking it up because uh, they can be sold, lettuce can be sold by head or bunch as well. Right. So. So yes. Yes, I okay. I would say it, if it's there, uh, and, and you know again if it's prepackaged, that's one item. If it's a direct sale, the consumer can pick it up and say this is one I want. Then that would be a direct sale, which you could go by head head a bunch at that time with lettuce. Okay. So they could they could sell it that way. I don't believe if it's a I believe if it's a direct sale, you will not need a, a, a label on it for truly a direct sale, which the consumer is, you know, picking it up there. But if it's mm -hmm. prepackaged and you're going to display it for sale, then that would be a little bit different. It gets in a little bit of gray area uh, as to how, how you consider it there. But I would say, you know, if the consumer is going to pick it up and that's the one they select, since it can be sold by head a bunch, you'd be good. Okay. Direct sale and consumer picking it up. Okay. Okay. Um, I have another question for you, Gary. Let me see. Can dried herbs that are jarred be sold by volume instead of weight? Oh, let me see. Again, I have to I have to look back into Handbook 130 and see what it says. Um, this is probably a well thumbed through handbook, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Very well. Very well.
off the top of my head, I would say, and, and this is something we probably would need to research a little bit. Uh, they can be sold by dry measure. I'm going to say what I'm looking at in Alpha Handbook 130, leafy vegetable describes herbs. Mm -hmm. can be sold by dry measure. And dried herbs that are jarred be sold by a dry volume measure. instead of weight. So mm -hmm. volume would be dry measure instead of weight. Yeah. Could be either or. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me see before I let you jump off if we got all of these. Um, okay, so we talked about the cut greens. I think we've gotten most of them that were specifically for you. Um, Gary, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you will follow up and check, I know that you have provided for me in the past the pages that pertain, a copy of the pages that pertain specifically to farmers markets that mm -hmm. folks can't regarding labeling. Um, if we could get a copy of the handbook, and if not, can we get what specifically, you know, is, is there anything that you can provide us that specifically applies to folks selling at a farmer's market that they could have as a resource? Well, I, what I can try to do is pull the pages of the methods of sale. I think that would be very beneficial. That so would be. Pull those and send those to you and you can distribute. And I would appreciate that. that okay, that would be greatly appreciated. And so. Um, for all of y'all that have asked, we will add that. We will get that from Mr. Milton and we will add that to all of our resources that we are sending out. So um, it's going to be a big email. It's probably going to be a link <laughs> at this <laughs> point, but I appreciate that as well as we'll post it on all of our um, our resources page, et cetera. Um, okay. The rest of the questions that are in the chat, we're going to continue to answer. Gary, thank you so much thank for, you. again, um, participating in today's summit and for always uh, being willing to answer my questions and uh, to helping the the markets. And I have seen uh, many of you out at uh, vendor kickoff meetings, weighing scales and also I really appreciate all of the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have before we wrap, we have a few more minutes and we have a bunch of our speakers that are still on with us. And so I thought I would see if I could ask a couple of these questions that are on here um, that we haven't gotten to yet. And those, again, that are about how to start a farmer's market and all, I'm happy to talk with you offline about that. If you want to reach out to Kim Hutchinson at BAFMA, Mary will drop my information into the chat and I can talk with you about um, starting a farmer's market. But my first recommendation would be that you look at Farmer's Market University and the 101 market certification, the market manager program which will give you all of the components that you need to understand um, about running a market before you decide to open a market, of which food safety is one of 5,000 pieces of that, or 12 or 15 pieces of it. Um, so we have a question about meats. We have a couple of questions about meats, and I'm not sure if this is an answer that we'll need to get from um, the meat folks, but are meats being sampled by a farmer? Um, do they need to be USDA inspected? Hey, Kim, I can answer that. But also, I was taking the questions down for meat and poultry. We do have our office of meat and poultry that are not. Okay, great. We'll send them the questions. But I do want to say any product, meat product sampled, I know they are going to say, yes, it has to be USDA inspected. Okay. I can, I can say that for them, but we will send those questions to my contact with meat and poultry. Okay. I appreciate that. And do you know, um, we have a question here regarding, and, I, and we may or may not be able to answer it, um, what type of permit or license does um, a vendor need to have if they're selling produce or they're selling meat? Is there any type of certification they need to have from the different departments or from the processors? What type of permit or license does a market manager need to ask its produce vendor and meat vendor to see to make sure they're compliant? Eric, yeah, we're getting, them, we're getting them all trained up for you. <laughs> Eric, I don't know if you have any comments on produce. So for produce vendors, you know, we we get this a lot and it's it's kind of why we started that registration portal, right? So right. our program within VDAX, the produce safety program, we do not issue permits or licenses to produce farms, regardless of size, right? So 
if you are a covered produce farm, meaning you don't meet one, meet one of the exemptions, um, you're going to get an inspection report from us. So that's maybe one way. But again, if you are exempt under either the micro exemption or the qualified exemption as a produce farm, one of the things that might help you is that certificate of registration or that certificate of exemption. So again, two different ways there you can help verify as a market manager uh, that the produce farm has done their due diligence with VDAX. Uh, but again, no, no permits or licenses. And again, for any meat products that are sold, like if it's made in jerky or, or bacon and it's retail sale, that does fall under food safety. Um, we can talk about that, but we can send the questions again about that permit. If someone's taking meat products and further processing them, that would fall under the food safety program. If it's sold retail, not wholesale, retail at the farmer's market, that would be under our inspection and they would need a permit. But if it's just the meat products, not further um, processed into meat products, I do not believe it does, but I do want to check with weights and measures to give you the correct answer. Thank you. Uh, do residential zoned homes who would like to offer a farm strand at the end of their drive, offering backyard suburban grown vegetables, eggs from their own hens, and low risk foods need any type of permit, inspection, certificate, et cetera? Yeah, I'm sitting here looking at Eric, Rochelle, and Karen. No, I know I am too. Everybody's like looking at everybody else going, tag, you're it. I, mean, I, I will say we're not routinely going out and giving every farm stand out there. And Rochelle and Karen, please add in and Eric if, I, if I'm saying anything wrong. But we're not routinely going out and permitting every farm stand that's operating selling their, their produce or um, the, the eggs. Now, if they're making products, if they're making the value added products, they've got to make sure they're inspected if they're not exempt. Those exempt products are supposed to be sold at a farmer's market or at their home. Um, but uh, do you have anything to add, Karen, Erica, and Michelle? Yeah, I do. And actually, I would encourage you to go back to your locality um, for zoning and make sure you're not violating zoning rules there. Start there. Make sure you're zoned appropriately. Thank you. I'll say for produce, Kim, um, some confusion with farms. We talk a lot about produce farms, right? we have a lot of individuals that do microgreens at their home, right? You know, either in a basement or, or whatever else, or we have people that have backyard gardens that want to sell produce right. for our program. And for regulatory purposes, even though it's at your home, you're considered a farm uh, by definition. So again, if you have a backyard garden and you're selling produce at a, say you're at the end of your driveway, you know, we're going to consider you a farm. And if the produce is under that $25,000 mark, you're going to be micro exempt. So please register in that portal. Thank you. And I would say your eggs, et cetera, that would fall under VDAX also. It would certainly apply to the same rules of needing to be refrigerated and things of that sort, being um, your definition of being cleaned and, and all of that. Um, so yes, you still need to check with your local agencies regarding permitting as well as VDAX. Um, let's see. Hey, can I add something to that? Yes. So by by registering and self-registering and self-verifying as inspectors, for instance, like Cynthia and I, while we're out doing our job, it helps us not stopping by your house while we're out and not just showing up because then we see you already in the portal and we see that you've already apply for that exemption and we're not just going to show up at your house when we're maybe out doing another inspection and we see a farm stand. So it shows us you're already doing that part of your job and it shows us that you've applied for that exemption and we don't see a farm stand and we don't know what you are doing or not doing. So if you apply on your own, we're not just going to stop by and knock on your door and say, hey, what well, you know, what's happening or what's going on? So if you do that, that's that part of that self-verification that we were talking about. So if you do that, we it, it just helps our, you know, system flow better. And also you get that certificate. Just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I do have a, I have two more questions and then I will maybe let you all off the hot seat for today. Um, can you address the difference between a homestead versus a farm? I'm not even sure who to ask that of. I'll just look at all of you. Somebody <laughs> jump in. 
I'm looking at Eric, but Eric. I'm looking at Eric, Eric too. Eric's stuff. backing away from his camera going. Uh. But, but I'm not sure. Are they referring to produce? And I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to. I mean, so like Farmstead, I know there's like a Century Farms and there's a group in Virginia at VDAX that works with Century Farms. And right. I don't know if there is a definition of Farmstead or Homestead. Um, I'm on, really unable to answer that and give a, a good good answer. Okay. Is there a difference? I guess I would ask the question, is there a difference in how you um, regulate uh, produce being sold if it's a homestead versus a farm? No, if you're, if you're growing and selling produce, you know, it, it's pretty much covered under that rule and you're going to look through the decision tree, you okay. know, and if it, even if you're a homestead or farmstead growing produce, you know, we're still going to consider those as part of that annual gross produce sales. Okay. And um, is there, if somebody could drop the portal link to get the exemption for micro farms in the chat, that would be great. Um, if you're growing at home and setting up a farm stand, is there a type of license or um, that a person needs? So you said if you're growing. Okay, at so let me read, let me read the actual question. Yeah. If I grow it at home and set up a farm stand, is this a type of license or just the name used? If I'm growing it's kind of like it, we I talked about before, right? I think, so I think so. Yeah. Regarding you've got extra an excess of tomatoes and corn and you want to set up a farm stand. Yeah. Yeah. Do just they need to have like the micro about, exemption. Okay. Yeah, it's like we talked about before, even though you're a home or you're in a residence and you have a garden. I mean, for all our our purposes and for our definitions, you're considered a farm based okay. you know, farm business. So, you know, yeah. Okay. And then can somebody, we get this a lot. Can somebody touch on microgreens and sprouts? Do they need a special permit or do they fall under any kind of special inspection? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So microgreens are going to fall under the produce safety program and, and the produce safety rule. And again, like we said, if you're doing it at home, you know, it's considered produce and we do allow that first harvesting cut. Um, I would recommend not to wash those microgreens if, before you put them in a bag or a clamshell. Um, and then it'll be in packaged form. It will need the label on it, right? Um, sprouts are a little bit different, right? Sprouts have their own basically rule or section under the produce safety rule, subpart M. Um, and they are highly regulated and there's a lot of a lot of things you need to do for sprouts. So if you have a sprout question, uh, please email me and we can talk, talk directly uh, because they're all a little bit different. Okay. And we'll have your uh, email address that we'll, we'll send out everybody's contact information. I know that's your favorite part. Um, let's see, I think that we have captured all of the questions. The last question we have is if anybody has any recommendation on brands for certified scales, I know you kind of backed off recommending where to buy them or anything of that sort, but if there are any brands that you really have found are good and sturdy that folks could make an investment in that you could unofficially recommend, that would be appreciated for scales. Any last questions that we have for anybody today, please I've tried to capture all of them. Um, please drop it into the chat and I would appreciate it. Um, I'd like to take a moment to really thank everybody for participating. I know that this is our second year doing this summit uh, and we're kicking it off doing it in segments. I think that it is, um, this was fantastic. It was um, so appreciated and I really am so thankful for your time and all of the resources in putting this together. Um, I think that this is uh, much easier to understand than us doing it over the course of nine hours in one day like we did last year. So I thank you all for being here today and jumping in and answering all the questions. I also would like to thank again our supporting partners for, uh, for helping to make this event happen. We're gonna follow up um, with an email that includes links to all the recordings of the presentations and the resources that were mentioned today. Uh, for those of you that have asked questions about the quiz, the quiz only applies if you're watching, if you not, if you did not participate live, if you are watching the recordings. So if you're watching the recordings, there are questions that have been provided by our presenters that you will answer in order to get your um, certificate of participation. The link for the certificate of participation has been dropped in the chat box. 
please fill that out and um, send it back in to us. And we will uh, make sure that we provide you, that we verify your participation and provide you with the appropriate certificate. Um, if you were not able to participate live today, alternatively, um, you can take the quiz and it'll be available in two weeks at farmersmarketuniversity.org. And after you take the quiz, you will receive a proof of participation in the summit. So we have just started to really kind of crack this nut, so to speak. Um, our next uh, session is on April 9th, which is Tuesday, April 9th. And we will have representatives from VDAX Dairy. We also will have CBD hemp. So boy, get your questions ready. Um, and we will have a conversation about pet food and selling uh, what the requirements are for selling pet food at a farmer's market. And then next Thursday, we're going to have representatives from uh, the Virginia Alcohol and Beverage Control Agency from ABC, as we call them. And we will have the Virginia Cooperative Extension folks that put together all of the food safety resources and do trainings. They do a variety of different uh, trainings for farmers and markets. And so that will be on Thursday. Um, ABC, just to give you all an idea, if you think, oh, I'm not, I don't have wine or beer at my farmer's market, that's fine. But you may have tinctures or vanilla or boozy bunt cakes or cupcakes that have booze in them, et cetera. So, or that might be an option down the road. So, um, you know, ABC is going to cover everything that has to do with alcohol um, at a market in Virginia. And then uh, pet food, we'll talk about what you can and cannot do regarding pet food and the regulations there. Of course, CBD hemp, that's going to be um, awesome. And uh, we'll cover all of the new regulations that occurred uh, starting in July of last year and the continued changes to CBD hemp and um, enforcement and what you can and cannot do in the state of Virginia. And then of course, dairy will cover all of the, the um, common questions and issues around dairy as well as um, the type of dairy you can sell versus the types of dairy that you cannot sell like raw milk and things of that sort. So now that I've stumbled through that and made it sound more confusing than it is, Tuesday, April 9th, we will have dairy, CBD, hemp, and pet food. And Thursday, April 11th, we will have Virginia ABC, and we will have the Virginia Cooperative Extension. So I want to, um, again, thank you all for participating today. And if there are no further questions um, that, uh, that we are being asked, we will uh, get ready to wrap this up. Um, how do we know who attended? The platform that we are using actually tracks all of the folks that registered and whether they participated in the amount of time that they were um, participating in the summit. So we will be able to verify that you did um, actually attend and that you were logged in for the duration of the summit. Um, whether you were paying attention or not, you know, that that's up to you, but we hope that you gained uh, knowledge and um, information. I really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and Thank everybody one last time. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, the recordings for today's session will be sent out via email to everybody that registered, as well as all of the information from all of the speakers, all of the documents that they provided, the links that were, um, you will actually get a copy of their PowerPoint presentation or whatever deck that they supplied us for their presentation. You'll get the recording um, and any resources that were um, talked about, as well as uh for example, with Gary sending us the additional pages that he's going to pull, we'll send those out, as well as all of the questions that were submitted prior to this with all of those answers for the FAQs and all of the questions that were dropped in the chat and in the resources today. So y'all are going to get a lot of information from us and it's going to come out, I'm going to say within the next two weeks um, and probably sooner, but I'm going to give us that. Um, if you're not sure if you can make the session on 411 and you're interested in the ABC segment, will that recording be available? And at what point will ABC be presenting? So ABC is actually presenting, um, uh, there are only two presenters that day and the presentation starts at nine. So without any further ado, I'm going to say thank you very much and good afternoon. We're going to end the meeting now until next week. Thank you. So nice to see everybody.